every single person in this room or at this conference has one thing in common. You can all prove who you are. When you were born, you, were, you got a birth certificate. And when you were a teenager, you probably got an identity card or maybe a driving license. And now I assume most of you have a passport that allows you to travel around the world. But how would you feel if I took that all away from you right now? The reality is that most people, not most people, sorry, 1.1 billion people around the world are exactly in that position. They have no way of proving who they are. They are functionally invisible in the eyes of the world. And big numbers like this get thrown ar around a lot, so I'm going to make this real for you uh, and explain to you what this actually means. So this is the Coral Slum in Dhaka in Bangladesh, where we do a lot of our work. And if you don't have identity in the slum like most people do, you essentially, you might not be able to enroll your child to education. You might get the wrong medicine from the health workers coming to your door. You might not be able to get a microfinance loan to start your business. And those are the real consequences of lacking identity. And as I'm sure people in this room understand, unique ID cuts across sectors. So if you look at the SDGs, for example, without unique ID, we're really just relying on guesswork. So if you look at maternal mortality, the estimates are 200,000 to 400,000 mothers die per year. That's a margin of 100%, which I think is frankly quite unacceptable, and just highlights that our whole industry is right now throwing billions at efforts and programs without relying on hard data of what is actually working and what isn't, often because we lack this unique identity. And biometrics are an interesting thing, because unlike cards or ID cards or anything that we discuss and we use in this country, biometrics is something you always carry with you. And so I want to create a little bit of context. A lot of you will already have heard about this, but this is India's Aadhaar system, which is essentially the world's biggest ID system. They've enrolled 1.1 billion Indians with their fingerprint biometrics, their iris scan, and various other data. And a lot of you will have heard about this and you know, heard the benefits of how it's fighting corruption, it's creating a lot of efficiency gains. But a lot of you will also have heard the challenges, especially around data security and privacy. I mean, last Tuesday in the Huffington Post was the last article around some privacy breaches in Adhar. And it's important to note because this is by far the biggest program that has been implemented globally when it comes to biometrics. And what I want to do today, so my, I'm Sebastian Manet, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Simprince. We're the world's only nonprofit biometrics company. And I want to share some experiences on things that have worked, things that haven't worked, and things to think about when you're thinking about biometrics in your program or your work. And I want to touch on accuracy, privacy, interoperability, and fraud as some of the key pillars that I think should be taken into account when thinking about biometrics. Let me start with fraud, uh, sorry, with accuracy. So if your hands are anything like mine, they are soft, white, Western, they've never really had to do any manual labor in their lives. And that is the reality of a lot of people in this room, but that's not the reality that we're dealing with when we're trying to implement programs on the front lines. So I took these pictures here. The one on the left is, could be mine, for example. The other three are representative of the populations that we work with. So for example, in our use cases, we're working with a lot of housewives who often have burns on their fingertips from holding hot pots. We're working with rickshaw drivers who you know, hold onto handlebars or farmers who have a hoe in their hand most of the time. And those are the people we need to build technology for. So when we started off, we took six leading biometric systems that were on the market that had 100% accuracy rates. As soon as you read the number 100%, red flag. Um, and we took those, and because we're from the University of Cambridge, we were a bunch of PhD students there. We, we like data-driven decision-making rather than you know, marketing-based decision-making. And so we took these systems to Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, Zambia, Benin, and we actually hand-collected 135,000 worn, difficult, scarred fingerprints in the right environmental conditions, humidity, heat, dust, moisture, all these things that you need to consider. And the reality was, the key finding was, yes, technology developed in the West wouldn't work in these areas. Why? We uncovered, and you're going to see this as a theme, there's a strong racial bias, often even gender bias, in technology because of the data that we built it with. So if you build it with these fingerprints and you take it to rural Zambia, how do you expect it to work? And so this is the first takeaway that essentially technology, especially biometrics, needs to be built for purpose, otherwise you're not even giving it a chance. 
The second one is privacy. Um, I took this picture in Rwanda around three years ago, and it was a very stark moment for me because in the morning I visited a genocide memorial, and you see how ID has been used in the past to commit atrocious crimes against humanity. And then you go to a biometrics conference in the afternoon where all these companies that are selling systems for millions of people around the world don't mention privacy once. And it's a pretty stark, contrasting experience. And because we are a social enterprise with a heavy mission, social mission, it was very clear to us that if we can't do no harm, we shouldn't be collecting any data in the first place. And so one thing that we've been advocating for internally, but really across the industry, is to take the strictest or most useful, in our words, frameworks that you can find, UK's Data Protection Act until recently, now the EU GDPR, and try to see how much of that can be applied in frontline context, because there's a lot of useful stuff when it comes to justifications for processing personal data, for consent, for data sharing, and really taking those frameworks and applying them. And then you see some groups on the right. We're trying to really engage with ID4D, ID for Africa, and also ID2020 to really make this message clear across the industries, which are international development and biometrics in our case. Interoperability, again, buzzword, right? Everyone throws it around. What does it actually mean? I want to touch on two key parts that you have to think about when you're doing biometrics and you're talking about interoperability. And as a nonprofit, we're heavily committed to open standards and interoperability, but this is what you need to think about. First, biometrics. They are open standards, especially the ISO 19749 that I put on the board. That's the one that you know, India uses, WFP Scope uses, UNHCR uses. That's not what you'll get from a biometric company if they're selling you technology. It, I mean, Nigeria is a good example. They procured you know, national scale technology to do an election. Then they enrolled tens of millions of people. Health ministry wanted to use it. They couldn't. They had to procure it again because they had been locked into proprietary technology. And then they did it again and again. They did it 12 times. And this is a huge waste of resources that is ethically reprehensible uh, and completely unnecessary from a technology perspective because we have open standards. We just need to push the industry and vendors to adhere to them. And the other one is around platforms. Biometrics is not a standalone solution. You can't deploy just biometrics. Biometrics has to work within your existing digital tools. You know, DHS2, whether if you, when you're working with governments, it might be Comcare and Agriculture, it might be Mangalogic, we actually have them right here, who work um, in healthcare and really deploy powerful systems that can be used for decision making all across your programs. And it needs to work within that. And if that hasn't been proven at scale, that integration, you're running a big risk when you start off a program. And the final one here is around fraud. So fraud is the elephant in the room. Uh, everyone knows it's happening. Nobody knows how much really in their programs. Our experience is it's huge. We see it's between 2 and 54% in all programs we work in, usually you know, 20 22%. And take a moment to think, what does it mean if 20% of your program's resources are going to waste. And with biometrics, you get it black on white. You have you know, 100 visits, 100 different fingerprints, or 100 visits, 100 times the same fingerprint. So you get this data down to a quite granular level straight away. And here's sort of how to think about biometrics as a whole. People often think of the bottom left. We just need a couple of scanners, and it's going to magically work. That's not how biometrics should be implemented. You need to think about all the different components that you see up here, and think about biometrics as a holistic system that you need to deploy. Focus on soft things like capacity building, interoperability, privacy, analytics. Because if you don't do that, you don't give it a chance. Some case studies, uh, I mean, we have our own experiences beyond the ones that we've witnessed externally, are currently in 10 countries, uh, reaching 4.5 million beneficiaries next year, so you, pretty large-scale operations, working across sectors, mainly healthcare, uh, cash transfers, humanitarian emergencies, agriculture, really anywhere where last mile identification is needed. And I wanted to highlight two specific examples to show you after sort of the things that you should think about what it could actually do. So three years ago, we started a pilot with 22,000 mothers across four slums in Dhaka, who were essentially, we had maternal health care workers who were going house to house delivering ANC, antenatal and postnatal care visits. They were equipped with biometric technology to streamline service delivery, but also to see what was actually going on in the program. And we conducted a randomized control trial backed by Gates Foundation UK at USAID, where we had three clusters. Traditional ANC, PNC visits, use of mobile technology, use of mobile technology, and biometrics. 
And the finding, essentially, we've just wrapped this RCT, was that using biometric technology increased the overall visits conducted by 38%. Again, that's a big number. What does it mean? It means that literally thousands of mothers were visited that would otherwise not have been visited, which can save thousands of lives. And we also uncovered a lot of programmatic issues that BRAC could use to address and save a lot of money and get a return on investment on the money they spent on the biometrics. Another one, cash transfers. There's a lot of investment in cash by a lot of big funders. It's a very effective development intervention, but it's cash. When there's cash, the incentives certainly are aligned in a different way to when you distribute other goods. And very often what we see is that you know, during registration, People who don't have formal ID register with things like mobile numbers, and they can register two or three times. During verification, they get verified with things, again, like a PIN number, which is left with a mobile vendor, and the mobile vendor just takes out cash when the person's not there. There's a lot of issues with cash transfer programs that we're trying to address with Concern Worldwide, Mercy Corps in Somalia, Nigeria, Uganda. And what we see is that you can functionally cut fraud to next to zero when you introduce biometrics into a cash transfer program. Now, where is this going? Um, I spoke a lot about fingerprint biometrics. I spoke a lot about hardware. I want to talk about the future. There's a very interesting innovation going on in biometrics that is, I think, the biggest innovation of the last 40 years. And that is around hardware-less biometrics using the smartphone camera of an Android phone um, and building, essentially, using AI algorithms that learn themselves what features of a face, of a palm, of a fingerprint to use to identify people, because until now, humans pre-programmed these systems. It's very exciting, but I want to highlight two things to think about as people you know, dive into the hype of AI-based biometrics. The first one is interoperability. Anyone here working in AI will probably be aware of this. It's a very new technology. There are no open standards for it. Nobody has developed them. Are you going to wait for the private sector to develop them? They are not going to do that because they benefit from proprietary systems. So essentially, just one thing to bear in mind, this cutting edge technology does not yet have open standards, which means it's not compatible with other government systems or other systems that might use a different provider. So feel free to join us. We are trying to work with funders to develop open standards for AI-based biometrics, because before we start investing billions into it, we better make sure that it is interoperable. And the second one is racial bias. This is a really interesting one. The two biggest producers of facial recognition, for example, AI facial recognition, are Google and Facebook, unsurprisingly. And they've come into the media earlier this year. I mean, Nature and MIT published papers, respectively. That if you're like me, white Caucasian male, or like Mark Zuckerberg, it works just fine. If you are a black senator, a woman, it just doesn't work. And why? Data sets. They developed it with data pictures of VIPs they could find off the internet. Guess what they are like. Um, and so again, this is just a racial bias that is built into the technology, which again, we are trying to address because we work, you know, we have huge data sets in Ethiopia and Bangladesh and Tanzania, and we're really trying to use that data in collaboration with some of these big players to create a technology that is very exciting and powerful, but that actually works. And I want to leave you on the note that I think it's not about if or when biometrics is going to be used in our sector. It's really a question of how. It will be used because the benefits are huge. But will it be used responsibly and with privacy-enhancing designs? Will it be affordable enough so that organizations like GIZ or NGOs can actually use it? And will there be standards in place, open standards, that allow the interoperability with other systems? Those are the questions that I think we should address. And as a community, the people who are right here, we have the tools, the knowledge, the power to influence which path we're taking so that biometrics will actually be deployed as a force for good. Thank you.